Hello, I'm Sophie Till. This is a series of presentations about the Taubman-Gilansky approach to strings. The presentations form a comprehensive series, but have also been designed to work alone so they can be used in various ways. They address some of the fundamental principles of the approach and show how these principles can provide answers to some of the most commonly asked questions by players of all levels, from professionals to students. The information presented makes most sense when we feel it ourselves, combining knowledge and sensation. There is an immediately recognizable, clear, physical logic to it. While these presentations are not a substitute for hands-on work, they can offer an entry point to this wonderful information. It is interesting that one of the most common questions from players of all levels is how to hold the violin. It is one of those things that once we are beyond the early stages of learning, we usually take for granted. Yet our obsession with the shoulder rest, chin rest conundrum reflects the confusion in our understanding of how the body holds the instrument. Without clarity as to which part does what, how they relate to each other and work in combination, we cannot be clear as to what parameters we are working within and therefore what enables us to hold with ease. We tend to become completely focused on the actual playing but forget that if the playing apparatus is to feel good and work easily, then of course holding the violin, the mechanism that provides the foundation for the playing, has to be organized clearly, easily and comfortably. Understanding how to hold the instrument enables the playing apparatus to function. And conversely, when that area is confused, it is likely to be disabling. It remains one of those nagging questions that seems to never be solved. We just feel that perhaps everyone must know something that we don't. So in the Boan presentation, I mentioned the fundamental Taubman principle, that if we want to do things with ease, then each part involved has to do its share according to what it is designed to do, no more or less. In other words, each part has to work in proportion to its capabilities. When a part does too much or too little, there has to be compensation for somewhere else, and this is often where we get into trouble. We can use the analogy of walking as we did in the Bow Fundamental presentation to illustrate this. We know that our toes are involved. They play their toe-like role in the walking mechanism. If you walk around without your toes, and you can try this even for just a few steps, or even without one toe, you can feel another part having to work beyond what feels good in order to compensate. If we walk like this for a long time, it would cause problems in other parts of the leg which are having to compensate, and we get pain and discomfort as a result. Equally important, knowing that my toes play a role does not make them the engine for the movement. You can try leading your walking from your toes, which of course feels ridiculous. Initiating the movement is not the role they were designed to play. In other words, they cannot do less or more than their toe-like share, and their role in the order in which the walking happens has to be clear. They cannot be heroic in their contribution if they were not designed to be so. It is important to state that one of the reasons for our confusion is that what we see when someone holds and plays the violin on the outside and what enables that to happen on the inside are not the same. We have to know what is happening on the inside, which is a different world to the way things look externally. We're talking about the mostly invisible world of motion that underlines our playing. When we are playing, we tend to be very concerned with the bits we can actually see or that are on top of the violin. The left hand, predominantly the fingers, my head because it's on top of the instrument, and then the bow over to the right. We forget that the entire system is connected to a torso underneath the instrument, and there is a holding mechanism in action all the way down to my feet. So if my arms are going to be free to move, then the holding of the instrument is crucial. Holding the instrument is an adjustable, balanced relationship between three parts, the shoulder area, the head, and the left arm. We have to understand exactly what each part does and how they relate and interact with each other if we are to have a complete picture. Let's start with the shoulder area and torso. The violin weighs something. So if we're going to put the violin on the shoulder area, 
we need to understand how the shoulder area and torso accommodate that weight, however light it may be. The accommodation of weight is something we do all the time. If you put a bag on your shoulder or you give someone a gentle shove, what you can notice is that there is a corresponding amount of let go to accommodate the object. Let go refers to the body's release of energy proportionate to the weight of the object. It's important to notice what the body does not do. So it does not push against the object, which would look like this. It does not remain neutral with no response whatsoever, or remain fixed and frozen in one place. In each case, you immediately feel how illogical it is for the body to respond in any of these ways and how they all make holding and supporting the object uncomfortable. Another familiar situation that illustrates this let go in action is holding a baby or a small animal. If we intake the instinctive let go out of our arms, it would feel very unstable and we'd be concerned we would drop what we are holding. In all these activities, we can also notice a second crucial response, how the torso is adjusting over the fulcrum of the feet, or if we are sitting over the sit bones. Turning over the feet looks like this. Any activity we make with our arms, head, or torso requires a response over the fulcrum of the feet or the sit bones. This response is almost imperceptible in daily life because it involves such tiny adjustments that we almost don't notice them, but we certainly notice them in their absence. Even just putting my hand on a head requires a response over the fulcrum of the feet or when sitting over the sit bones. You can try this sitting and standing and just moving your arms to different places and feeling the adjustment over the feet. When we don't understand this, we often try and compensate by using the hips and the back in an isolated way, creating a twist and tension, often combined with trying to hold the violin up, which adds to the tension. When we start working with these concepts, I often suggest that people use what I call 24-hour practice. It doesn't mean you play the violin for 24 hours. In fact, in some cases, you may not touch it at all. But, for example, the accommodation of weight in the body whether it be with our hands, shoulder, or anywhere else, through the corresponding let go and adjustments over the fulcrum of the feet or sit bones is there all the time in all our daily activities. So 24 hour practice means observing these things in our day-to-day -day activities and recognizing the concepts and sensations so we can build an awareness and understanding of what these elements are. This type of work makes it much easier to locate what we want when we go to the instrument. So going back to the violin, when the violin connects with the shoulder area, the shoulder receives the instrument with a corresponding amount of let go and adjustment over the fulcrum of the feet. We need to feel the whole shoulder rest and be sensitive to the whole violin and receive the entire thing or we cannot support the whole instrument. As I put the violin up, you can see my torso adjusting over the fulcrum of the feet. For many of us, there is little or no awareness of what is going on in the shoulder area. When asked, many players will often describe it as a blind spot, as dead, or feeling one specific focal point intensely, sometimes having a sense of things being dense or compressed in that area, or just plain nothing at all. If I take the violin away, and place my right hand on the shoulder area, I can start to notice another very important piece of the picture. As the left arm moves around, I can notice how much response there is in the shoulder area. This is the second crucial element along with the receiving of the instrument. We said at the beginning that this is the three-part holding mechanism that has to be adjustable. So my left arm does not remain in one place. Any movement that my left arm makes will have a corresponding response in the shoulder area. You can really feel this response under your right hand as the right hand rests here and you move around, even though it's barely visible. We need to add something else here that's very important. 
As with our walking and toe analogy, we have to know which part is initiating the movement. This leads us to the rule about the shoulder, regardless of what activity we're doing. The shoulder cannot initiate movement, as it will fatigue almost immediately, but it plays a very important role as an enabling part. The shoulder responds to movements initiated by the forearm, perfectly synchronized and in perfect proportion, just as it does in all daily activities. You can feel and observe this very simply. If I go back to having my right hand on my left shoulder and moving the arm around, I can feel the shoulder area responding to all the movements. The shoulder is following my forearm. If I try and initiate the movement from the shoulder, it doesn't feel good and fatigues immediately. Likewise, if the shoulder is unable to, to respond, is frozen or late and unsynchronized, then the motions in the left arm will become very arduous and difficult. If I hand someone a cup of coffee, my forearm initiates, but you can see the shoulder responding. It would be very strange if I did it otherwise. So when the shoulder functions in this proportionate and synchronized way, we don't really feel it at all. It is just there. We do notice it very quickly when this enabling role goes wrong and it tries to take over or not to follow. So this kind of exercise is a good way to start to build an awareness of how the shoulder area responds to the motions in the left arm. It needs to be very alive in that area if the left arm is to be free to move and the violin is to feel supported. If I add the violin, but not my head, I can sense those responsive movements under the shoulder rest. Most people need to practice this for a while to bring that area into their field of awareness. You want to pay attention to how the shoulder area responds and how you are moving over the fulcrum of the feet. If these things are not allowed to happen, you can immediately feel how restricted the movements in the left arm become. So to summarize, the shoulder area needs to do two things. It receives the instrument and it responds in perfect proportion and synchronization to all movements initiated by the left forearm. So let's move on to the role of the head. There is a fundamental Taubman principle that all movements have to happen within a medium range of motion in order to be efficient. When we try and do things in an extreme range of motion, we're not so successful. Think about reaching for that object that just is a tiny bit too far away. It's almost impossible to grasp it. Yet, if the same object is close enough, you can hold it very easily. This applies to the head also. It has to meet the violin within its medium range of motion. It is very simple to feel where that is. So the average head weighs about 11 pounds. When the head goes lower than a certain point, that weight, that 11 pounds, starts to hang off the back of the neck. Equally, if I turn slowly to the left and the right, I can start to feel the point at which there is a pull down the side of the neck. So my head has to be working at a height and angle which keeps it within its medium range of motion. This will dictate the height and position of the chin rest. And we'll come back to this at the end when we have all the pieces. Many people describe the relationship of the head to the chin rest as predominantly feeling the front of the jaw, like a strip of the jawline that does most of the work, or as feeling the head being very heavy, or as having one focal point dominating their awareness. But we don't need all 11 pounds to support the instrument. When we experience the head as heavy or one particular point or area, it usually means the head is collapsing onto the chin rest. So we need to understand the relationship between the head, the chin rest, and its role in the three-part holding mechanism. If I make my hands into a pillow, I can start to gain an understanding of what we want. Notice that when you do this, the head does not feel heavy. And even though only specific parts of the head are touching the hands, the experience is that the whole head is resting on the hands, not one little piece of the head or part of the face. So how come we know what to do here? The body calculates vast amounts of information through touch. The most obvious example is when our hands are cold and we can't feel and it's hard to hold things and to move because we've lost the sense of touch. My face feels my hands in this pillow example. 
And through that sense of touch, I register how much my hands can support my head and how much my head needs to rest on my hands to feel good. This is a two-way relationship. The head rests on the chin rest, but the chin rest is supporting the head. If we don't recognize and understand this, then we tend to just drop our heads onto the chin rest in a one-way direction, which causes us to collapse the head. You can feel this too if you use the pillow example again, but this time picture it as a one-way relationship with the head just going down onto the inanimate hands. You can feel the head immediately becomes heavy and the back of the neck tightens. When we're thinking this way, the relationship of the head to the chin rest is hard to feel. And instead of sensing the whole head, we start using one part of the jaw, cheek, or chin to hold the violin up. When we understand and can feel the two-way relationship, the head is supported by the chin rest while also connecting to it. We feel the entire head, and it is a clear, gentle, easy relationship to the instrument. We need one more piece for understanding the head. We already said that the shoulder area has to respond to all the movements in the left arm. So it goes without saying, therefore, that if the violin is resting on a responsive shoulder area, the violin will be moving. And if my head is resting on top of the violin, it will be responsive too. The head has to respond to all the movements in the left arm also, if it is to maintain the same relationship. In the case of the head, this is very tiny, but the ability to respond is essential. Again, a bit like adjustments we make in daily life over the fulcrum of the feet, they are so small as to be almost imperceptible. But when we really notice them is when they are absent. This is the same with a lack of responsiveness in the head to what is going on underneath. It will mostly be invisible, but must be there if our three-part mechanism is to remain in balance. This brings us to a very important Taubman principle. If I feel good in one place and want to go somewhere else and feel the same, I must take all the same ingredients with me to the next place. If I leave parts behind, then I have different ingredients working in the new place and will, it will not feel the same. We often try to make things feel the same by fixing ourselves in one place. But this means that when I go somewhere else, such as a different position, string, or part of the bow, I have totally different ingredients working in the new place, and it cannot possibly feel the same. So we experience unity of feeling through the continuous adjustment of all the parts according to the task we are doing. These are usually almost imperceptible to somebody watching, but very vivid to us in action. So my head has to respond to all the movements of the violin resting on the shoulder. The head and chin have a soft, responsive relationship to the instrument, with the violin resting on the shoulder and the head resting on the chin rest, but being supported. It is important to note that while doing these exercises, if I need to let go of my left hand, I will always support the violin here with my right hand in this corner. As we said at the start, this is a three-point relationship. If I take one of those three points away, something else will have to do more. In this case, if there's no left arm doing its share, the head will have to grip and the back of the neck will tighten. This radiates through the shoulders and we are on a very slippery slope of discomfort. So let's move on to the role of the left arm. The first thing we need to be aware of is the basic alignment of the finger hand and forearm unit. We use this all day, every day in activities other than playing. For example, holding a cup, cleaning our teeth, lifting objects, holding a water bottle, and in every case, we instinctively line up the forearm behind the hand. It would look and feel really strange if we did not. I would never go and pick up a cup like this. We have fulcrums in the knuckles, in the wrist, in the elbow, and the shoulder. When we are aligned in this way, each of the fulcrums is able to do its share. When one of those fulcrums, even in the tiniest of ways, moves out of alignment, another will have to do more and we are back on our slippery slope of parts compensating. 
If I take a very simple task like holding a cup, it is easy to see the way the finger hand and forearm unit line up. If I break that alignment, for example, at the wrist, I can immediately feel the fingers tighten because they've lost the support of the forearm. What enables me to hold the cup easily is the forearm lending its support to the hand. The fingers are not trying to do the task in isolation. So understanding the basic alignment of the finger hand and forearm unit brings us to the fine five main causes of pain, injury, fatigue, and discomfort. While some of these are more relevant to the playing mechanism rather than the holding of the violin we are addressing, it is helpful to see and know all of them together. It is important to know that it is always the case that there is a way to play and do things without involving any of these. So the first is breaking a fulcrum. This refers to breaking a fulcrum such as the wrist or one of my knuckles and where you can see immediately how there needs to be a compensation elsewhere. Collapsing the knuckles is very common in the left hand, but any fulcrum can collapse. When the shoulder tries to relax rather than respond, this is a form of collapse also. Stretching, this refers to one or more of the parts having to work in an extreme range of motion. When we looked at the head, for example, we looked at understanding its medium range of motion, but this applies to everything we do. If I stretch a finger, it loses its connection with the finger hand and forearm unit that provides it with support and enables it to work with ease. Equally, if I stretch my arm away from my torso, the left arm can no longer access the support of the torso and has to work very hard. Now we come to isolating, which often goes along with stretching and refers to the use of one part in isolation from the whole. So for example, in the discussion about the role of the head, I mentioned how for some of us, the feeling of the front of the jaw is dominant on the chin rest. This is a form of isolation. The front of the jaw has become isolated from the whole head and its role in the holding mechanism. Isolation is common in both the left and right hands in many different forms. Twisting refers to a fulcrum moving sideways away from the whole unit. So when the wrist twists, it moves sideways from the forearm. But one of the most common forearm twists is the left arm pulling to the right in order to reach the strings. And finally, curling. I'll talk about this more when we look at the playing of the fingers but curling refers to the last joint of the fingers pulling inwards, creating tension through the finger hand and forearm unit. We can curl one or many of the fingers and we can curl the thumb too. So we need to keep all these things in mind as we look at how the left arm actually comes up into a playing position and plays its role in the three-part holding mechanism. Because the world underneath the violin is so foreign to us, we don't even think about the motion that gets the left arm up there. Many issues come from the arm being pulled over to the right, which creates a large twist in the arm, and then the hand twists around from the wrist in order to reach the strings, and we can have a cocktail mix of issues. So as we looked at earlier, we can only initiate arm movement from the forearm. The shoulder can never initiate motion, only follow. So the way the arm can get to the violin is a movement from the forearm that we call falling up. It has easy momentum down by my side, and when it swings up, everything slots into place easily. You can actually see the arm slot into place. So training the arm to fall up takes some practicing away from the instrument until we can learn to identify it clearly. You can see when I do it, how the alignment is there of the finger hand and forearm unit. And my forearm is happily keeping the arm in that position so there's no fatigue. I'm not using the shoulder to bring the arm up or to keep it up. If I do this next to the violin, I can feel how that resonates through the shoulder area and the head. It's important to notice also that when it is correct, the arm falls up next to the waist and knows how far away from the torso it really wants to be. 
If I'm practicing falling up away from the instrument, the arm wants to land just a few inches from the waist. It doesn't feel good too far out to the left, too far in front, or falling into the body. So sometimes I'll describe the right spot as feeling like there's a little cushion of air that makes the arm have a buoyant feeling in relation to the torso. It is very important that the arm learns where this is so it recognizes its connection to the torso. Sometimes this takes a while, particularly when the arm has been pulled over to the right a great deal. So now we need something that turns the hand around to face the strings. Forearm rotation is a movement we use every day to turn the hand while maintaining the basic alignment of the arm. Rotation is also fundamental to the Taubman technique. The forearm turns from all the way back here and turns the entire forearm and hand as a unit while also resonating through the upper arm. If I go to turn a doorknob, I would use this movement. If I brush my teeth, I'm using it too to turn the toothbrush towards me. We use it all the time without noticing it and it is absolutely essential to allowing the arm to function easily. So for our left arm, it is the only way the hand can turn towards the strings and maintain the fundamental alignment of the finger hand and forearm unit because everything is turned together. We spent a lot of time in the early stages training this movement for complete freedom, working with objects and just turning the forearm. Notice how I am helping with my right hand, but as close to the elbow as possible to ensure the movement comes all the way from the back. The forearm flips over easily and slots into the turn position. Notice also that I'm doing this with the arm close to the torso, so it is not stretched out or isolated. So now we can start to put things together and combine the falling up movement with a fundamental forearm rotation that turns the finger hand and forearm unit towards the strings. After a while, we don't even need to think about this. It is the way the arm gets to the instrument, so it arrives lined up and completely free and ready to play. Here they are in combination. Notice that my hand looks exactly the same this way around and this way around. So that forearm rotation allows that fundamental alignment to remain. So now we have the pieces that enable the arm to start to do its share in the three-point holding of the violin, the shoulder area, the head, and the left arm. We need to be very clear that it is the left forearm, not the hand, that does the share of supporting the violin because it is a three-point system. This is simple to feel. If I put the violin up with all three parts, I do not need my thumb or fingers specifically to hold the violin. But if I remove my head and leave only two parts of the mechanism, you'll see the fingers will have to hold because I've removed one of the three points in the system. Exactly as we said at the beginning, each part has to do its share, no more and no less. It is helpful to find another object where we can start to employ the same thinking. So I can do this with the water bottle. If I hold the water bottle in my right hand and then add my left hand to support it too, I can happily move the left arm around to any place on the bottle I want. I am not holding with a specific part of my fingers or thumb. The forearm is doing the work of supporting the bottle. Different parts of my hand will be touching it depending on where I am on the surface, but it is not specific to the base of my first finger thumb or fingertips. So just as we looked at earlier, our sense of touch is crucial here. It is the tactile sense of the hand that enables the left forearm to know how much to do so the fact that the hand is touching somewhere, even though not necessarily the fingerboard or with the fingers, is very important. We often don't notice how much the rest of the left hand makes light contact with the instrument because we're always thinking about the fingers, particularly the fingertips. But this light variable touching enables the forearm to calculate how much let go is necessary to feel good. 
This is not the same as using the thumb or fingers themselves to do the holding. If I go back to the bottle and take my left hand away from the bottle, I can also feel how the right arm then has to support more. If I add the left arm back, I can feel the right arm adjust and hold a little less as the left arm helps to do the work. It is very easy and light, but there is no question as to how the left arm makes its contribution and what that contribution is. What this exercise can also help us realize is that we often equate holding the violin with being stationary, fixed in one place or on one spot of the body, such as the thumb. What we can see though is that it is a movable support system that is happily adjusting all the time, depending on where we are. Some part of my hand is always touching. It may be very different parts of my hand and nothing to do with the specific parts of fingers, but there is touch that communicates to the forearm how much to support. So let's add this to the violin. My left shoulder receives the violin adjusting over the fulcrum of the feet. The head rests and is supported by the chin rest and the falling up and fundamental rotation in my left arm can get my left arm comfortably to the instrument. I can feel the instrument resting on me in a vivid way. Then I can start moving from one place to the next and feeling how the three parts balance themselves. So there is one final concept to make this completely clear. Often someone can go through these steps understand each part, but when they come to putting it together, they move like this over the violin. So what happens when I'm moving like this is I'm moving but not arriving. We are designed to arrive vertically and to think from vertical to vertical. This point comes up again and again in tone production. We are not designed to never arrive. Walking works this way also. My foot goes down into the ground and sends me up across and down to the next arrival point, my next foot. I cannot always be in between them. The in-between happens as a result of being down on one foot that sends me down to the next foot. It is physically impossible to not walk this way. This applies to my left arm also and affects the holding mechanism. Very often our brains are what I often describe as wired back to front. Our thinking is on the moving and not on being in one place that sends us over to the next place just as it does in walking. So this brings us to the final concept, the concept of being down on the instrument. The body has to be down and settled to function. When we feel up, there is tension and inefficiency and we cannot function with ease. We feel down when we send ourselves from place to place as opposed to moving ourselves around. When we walk, we send ourselves from foot to foot. With the left arm moves, it goes from place to place, always arriving, however briefly, and is being sent from that place to the next. This enables the arm to feel down and connected and at ease. So if we add this last piece to all that we've looked at, this holding mechanism looks like this. You can see my arm settle in each place and you can see my torso adjusting in tiny ways over the fulcrum of the feet. And the basic alignment of the left arm is always present. So now we can come back to the chin rest, shoulder rest conundrum. If we know that all parts have to work within a medium range of motion and the role of each part, we realize that the left arm has an optimum height at which it feels best. If I try and make the left arm work above that height, which is often the case, then the arm fatigues. So this is what dictates the shoulder rest. It needs to be, enable the arm to be at its optimum height to support the violin and move with ease. Equally, the head has to be in its medium range. What often happens is we raise the shoulder rest to help the head, but that actually just displaces the arm from its optimum place or vice versa. We often go around in circles with this. So my arm has its optimum height to function, which dictates the shoulder rest, 
and my head has its medium range of motion, so I need a chin rest that puts us there. There are adjustable chin rests available, so we actually have many options for finding this sweet spot. We have to remember too that we don't all wear the same size shoes. That would be strange, and if we all tried to wear the same, it would feel very odd. We choose shoes to fit us based on the parameters of our feet. This is the same with the chin rest shoulder rest. The parameters are the optimum height for the left arm and medium range of motion for the head. So in conclusion, we need to understand and train each part of this holding mechanism to feel at ease. But it is clear and possible to do so when we know what role each plays and how to locate that role within our own bodies. I know I am holding the instrument. It is comfortable, adjustable, and clear in the body as to who is doing what all the time.